the Titanic sank into the ice, the band played on. Originally hired to create pleasant background music for the upper-class passengers as they dined or played bridge, the musicians, most of whom were in their twenties, most of whom were paid only a shilling a month, found a new mission. Keeping passengers calm as they boarded the too few lifeboats, comforting the doomed. According to witnesses, the band played up until the very end, when the ship finally went down. Their last song was a hymn, called Nearer My God to Thee. When I read the news about our ongoing climate crisis, when I see pictures of kids in Australia huddling together in the surf while the sky is on fire behind them, or hear about climate refugees fleeing famines caused by unprecedented drought, I start thinking about that band on the Titanic. As artists and writers and musicians, are we doing the same thing? Are we just keeping people calm while the ship goes down? In this episode, we're going to talk about what our responsibilities are as creatives during a climate crisis. Joining us is Serena Ulibari, a speculative fiction author who has edited several solar punk anthologies. Thanks for coming on the show. Do you want to start by telling us a little about yourself? Um, sure. So I'm an, uh, my name's Serena. I'm a writer and an editor. I run a small press called World Weaver Press. Um, I, that's where I published those uh, the solar punk anthologies. They're called Glass and Gardens. And uh, we also um, arranged the translation of a Brazilian solar punk anthology. They were the first ones to use that term. So this is kind of my niche uh, solar punk, which is optimistic climate fiction. Um, I've also published a, a few short stories uh, within this uh, within this genre. Nice. Now let's start off the bat and talk about what is the responsibility of writers and artists during the climate crisis. Do we have an obligation to deal with global warming in our work, or should we just provide escapist fantasy to comfort people in a in an unstable, scary world? Well, I think the only obligation that artists and writers really have is to create something that is true to them, that speaks that speaks a truth uh, within themselves that, that other people can connect to. Uh, with that said, I do think that if you're writing uh, or depicting near-future science fiction and you're ignoring climate change, that does seem a bit irresponsible to me. Mm. I think that uh, doing, you know, just just ignoring climate change, pretending that you know it all got magically fixed, hand waved away, I think, can create a sense of complacency and just this, uh, or even feed into you know denialism. So I think that writers and artists who are dealing with with the future, especially the near future, do have an obligation to handle that uh, carefully. Um, in terms of providing escapist uh, work, I think there's a lot of power in escapist fantasies. I don't think that that's a bad thing at all. And I think there's also often a lot more going on under the surface of some of these things that we might consider just fluff. Um, I want to give a specific example. So like, you know, I'm in you know, this, uh, isolation right now because of the pandemic, like, like most people. And uh, right. so this, the first night of, um, you know, of the quarantine uh, in our city, at least, um, my husband and I were just, we were stressed out. We've been, you know, trying to get all our supplies and everything. We're looking on Netflix for something that's just, you know, to take our mind completely off of all of this. So what we end up right. watching was Kung Fu Panda 2, because what can be fluffier <laughs> and dumber than that? Like, it, you know, we were just like, is it, it'll be a total escapist thing. And it is, but I also realized by the end of it that it was actually a really well-written story with some important, you know, messages about uh, the choices that we make and how we handle trauma and things like that. So sometimes underneath all the fluffy escapist uh, things that you might dismiss, there's actually a lot more going on. And uh, sometimes if you just kind of hit people in the face with like, oh, this is, you know, this is a serious thing, it can turn people off. Whereas if you go in in a fluffy escapist way, sometimes you end up, uh, you know, it's like wrapping a pill in, um, in, you know, in candy. And, uh, you know, that's how you really get, uh, you really get through to some people. Putting it in peanut butter before you give it to your dog. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of value in that. Right, right, right. 
Well, that sort of segs into my next my next question, which is, do we give people hope or do we scare the shit out of them? <laughs> How do we strike that balance? Yeah. Like, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about Greta Thunberg, that teenage climate activist who said, adults keep saying we owe it to the young people to give them hope, but I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. Does she have a point? Like, should how like how, what kind of balance do we strike between hope and fear because on the one hand if you scare people too much you know despair can make people feel helpless and like oh my god there's nothing we can do but on the other hand could too much hope turn people a little complacent like oh it'll work itself out it'll be fine we don't need to worry too much yeah absolutely and this this is an important question and um i'm a big fan of greta and um, I think that, you know, when she says things like that, it comes from this real, you know, angry frustration that, you know, mm. that, the, that the, the people in charge are not, um, you know, doing what they could be doing to, to save her future, you know, the future of the young people. So, um, I mean, I, I resonate with, with everything she says. I really do. So solar punk as a genre deals with this exact question. This is this is why solar punk exists even. Um, so the, there's climate fiction, which has been around for, you know, a long time and is, you know, I don't know when the term was exactly, you know, st- started to be used, but it was fairly recently. But climate fiction often takes the, the pessimistic route. You know, if this goes on, then look at right. how horrible things are going to be. And, um, and that's a you know that's what a lot of science fiction does honestly and um, you know science fiction is very good at predicting what can go wrong and you know there's power to that and uh, and it can definitely change people's opinions and get their attention so um, so like you mentioned it this can also make people feel helpless especially when we're dealing with something as big as climate change I think it's a really common reaction when people hear about uh, you know predict the, the what's already going on with climate change and also the the really dire predictions people can just say well we're doomed so why should I have to you know make any inconvenient changes in my life um, you know if we're just all gonna die in flames anyway um, you know and so some people can approach it that way or, the, or it's just too big. It's just too big to even wrap your head around. Um, you know, when you look around the world uh, and and think, really, it's going to be like that. It's it's easy to just say, nah, that's you know, I can't even. That can't. That's not going to happen. So because a lot of climate fiction go takes that route of you know what if this goes on, then here's how bad it can get. Solar Punk decided to um, take the other route, which is, um, hey, if we fix the world, this is what it could look like. Mm. I mean, sure, there, th- sure, there's a risk that optimism can, can lead to complacency, you know, especially if it's magical solutions or, uh, you know, hand wavium solutions, like I said earlier, if it's, um, you know, if it doesn't show the work that goes into it then I think it could lead to um, just, oh, well, everything will work out. Someone will save us. Um, and, that, you know, that can be dangerous as well. But I think uh, most of the solar punk stories that I've edited or that I've written, they don't really take that approach. They, they show people working together. They show the changes that, um, that people have to make. And, you know, not all of them are, are great, but, um, but what solar punk does is shows the ways that people make their lives better, even in dire situations, even when things aren't exactly the same as they used to be. Okay, yeah. Now, before we go on, you've used the term solar punk a bunch. Uh, Would you like to explain a little bit what solar punk is in case some of our listeners might not be super familiar with the term? Sure. So essentially, it's a movement of art and fiction and activism that imagines a better future where we have either mitigated the worst effects of climate change or adapted to them. Um, So there's solar punk fiction, there's solar punk artwork, um, and there's also, you know, a community of people that are that are working toward these goals um, in, you know, in, in real life as well. So uh, we, we take the term solar from, you know, solar power, uh, which is, you know, renewable energy, but also uh, just from the idea of having a brighter future. And then the punk comes from uh, pushing back against the mainstream narrative that we are doomed and there's nothing we can do about it. Right. The cyberpunk future where everything sucks. Exactly. Yeah. Which we're practically in, honestly. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, pretty much. I was hoping people had cooler outfits, though. Usually cyberpunk <laughs> movies, everybody's got really interesting hair, and it's all very boring. <laughs> it's true. It's true. We, uh, we didn't quite live up to the style. Yeah, yeah. I want more neon and crazier eye eyeglasses, crazier eyewear. <laughs> There are some other sort of genres, I guess, of sci-fi, of speculative fiction that deal with the climate, like mm -hmm. cli-fi. People, some people really hate the term mm -hmm. cli-fi, I don't know. Do you think cli-fi can be a little bit counterproductive in a way? Like, a lot of, a lot of cli-fi stories are these sort of fun adventures, and I'm wondering, is there something maybe a little irresponsible about turning something really upsetting, like global warming, into fodder for like, oh boy, we're going to have a fun surfing adventure. Like, dude, do you know how many people would die <laughs> in this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe. Um, there might be something kind of Like, do you know how many famines there would be in this situation? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, so there might be something kind of counterproductive. I guess it depends that. a little bit on your approach to it. The, yeah, the approach always matters, um, you know, and if it's taking the um, the issue yeah. seriously or just kind of, uh, you know, using it as a backdrop. But, I mean, how many, uh, you know, fun adventure stories were there about nuclear holocaust, you know, or you, nuclear nuclear war? Um, you know, that was, the, that was the major issue of the 20th century. And oh, um, and there were you know tons right. of uh, tons of movies and and books and stories that used that as a backdrop, right? Or Nazis? Yeah. I mean the the <laughs> yeah, like the Indiana Jones series. It's this really fun adventure series about Nazis, which are not fun at all. Right? You know, but, but not even not not happy. Right? Stuff. But not, you know, but they're the bad guys in that. So you know. Um, but yeah, so so maybe, but I, I think we just I think we got to work with what we got, and you know, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, right. just like just like the those you know, the Holocaust and, and nuclear war and things like that were the major issues of the twentieth century. I think climate change is one of the major issues of the twenty first century. So this is sort of the backdrop that we that we have to work with, and um, and I don't I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with uh, with using that backdrop, just done in a responsible way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. How about generation ships? I mean, I've seen there's a sort of a genre of stories about people who flee the polluted world by going out to terraform another planet or going off in a sort of a generation ship. And I'm wondering, because I've seen people, a lot of people who are big sci-fi fans suggesting that that should be our real solution in the world we have, which like, on top of, to me, being kind of immoral, it's also just not feasible. Like, we do not have the technology to terraform Mars, for God's sake. It'd be just a lot more realistic and a lot more practical to just try to fix Earth than to be like, yeah, we'll somehow completely transform Mars into a livable planet. Like, do you, do you think any of those stories can maybe give mm. people the wrong idea or give people a kind of harmful false hope? Or am I just taking this too seriously? I don't know. <laughs> Um, sure. So I like to think that we will be able to save Earth and keep it habitable and, you know, adapt to the changes that we can't uh, prevent anymore. And, you know, I also like to think that we will someday, uh, you know, go to other planets and, uh, and be able to live that sort of uh, Star Trek future. Um, you know, that's, that's something that I also would like to see. So I, to me, it's not an either or, um, but I, I do agree that if, if the backdrop of a, of a story is just, well, you know, too late. You know, we, we, we can't save the world, give up. And you know now we just have to go find something else. I, I do feel a bit of despair when I read those kinds of stories, and there are some really good ones actually. I just read um, *The Calculating Stars* by Mary Robinette Cole, and it kind of takes that premise. Um, it's a climate change analogy where um, there was a there was a um, meteor that struck Earth in the 50s, and so it started the the space race like extra early because um, because the effects of the meteor are very much like the effects of climate change and are going to uh, make the, make the world uninhabitable in you know 50 100 years something like that and so they're racing to get their space pro program up and and uh, and running so that they can get off and and find somewhere else to live and it's a fantastic book and I love it and um, so I don't want to you know imply that I think that that was you know irresponsible or anything like that I think you know it's definitely a climate change analogy and the character makes it clear that this is one avenue 
that they're pursuing. It's not the one solution. They are also, you know, the characters involved in space uh, flight, so that's where the story is centered. But there are other things that are um, that are happening to try to, you know, save save the world as well. Um, so, you know, there's no one solution to climate change. There's no one solution to, you know, all of humanity's problems. So I think we should pursue uh, as many of them as we can. A lot of amazing developments have come out of the space program that don't have anything to do with space the way that we use them now. Um, so I think that we can still learn a lot by looking off of the planet, but I don't think that it should be the only place that we're looking. Right, right, right. So let's talk a little bit about our approach. Like, if you're ever trying to deliver a message, there's always this, like, pull between how subtle do I go, how blunt do I go? Like, if you go so super subtle, people might absorb the message subconsciously, or but they might miss the point. But if you're super blunt, people might get kind of turned off and be like, oh my god, this is so, you know, this is so preachy but at least they'll get the point, but then they might not even want to read it because they'll be like, oh, I don't want to hear this hippie propaganda. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> like how do you strike a balance there? Yeah, so in uh, reading submissions for the, the several um, solar punk anthologies that I've edited, we, d we tend, we being me and whoever else is helping me read submissions, we tend to uh, not really accept the real didactic ones, the real um, preachy kind of, kind of stories. Uh, often when authors are trying too hard to get their message through, um, you know, other things that are important to storytelling, like characterization and, uh, you know, theme and just, you know, the subtlety that makes a story good um, gets a little bit lost in right. in the message. And, you know, it's not always the case, but, um, but when it does, um, you know, then it makes the story not really ring true. So with the two Glass and Gardens anthologies I edited, with uh, Solar Punk Summers, which was the first one I did, um, I think the the stories in that are a little bit more subtle. Um, authors were not really always willing to sort of say, you know, climate change or be real direct about it. You know, it's all there in the in the background and and in the in the me in the message and themes, but right. it wasn't real direct. Whereas in Solar Punk Winters, which I did a couple of years later it's a lot more direct in that one. It's, you know, it's not, they're not preachy, they're not didactic, but, but authors, um, mm. just during that submission period were like a lot more willing to just go there and to not, you know, be couching it in, you know, mm. in metaphor and such in the, in the same way that, that more of the, the summer's authors did. And I think that's just a, a difference of, you know, 2017 when I was reading the submissions for summers versus 2019 when I was reading the submissions for winters. Just in those couple years, climate change became a much more mm -hmm. mainstream issue, and we were seeing things like the you know, the climate marches, and it just it became right. a much more uh, common and comfortable to talk about this issue, and in you know in in the public sphere. And I think that the stories sort of reflected that so the winter's stories that came out in this year um are in general more direct and uh more more direct than the than the summer stories mm -hmm. were they're all about climate change but um you know the winter's ones are a lot more direct about it i can see that i, I mean i'm guessing just seeing the photos from australia might really oh, <laughs> make you feel a little bit more like addressing mm -hmm. that stuff directly and, and not so subtly they were so alarming oh my gosh yeah, and it really, yeah, it drives it home and makes it more personal, you know. Yeah, yeah. Now, something that I always find really fantastic about Ursula Le Guin's writing is that she doesn't just approach these topics, like she's very politically progressive, but she doesn't just approach these topics in so much of a direct way, but the way she writes stories kind of requires you to shift into a totally different mindset. Like when she's writing, instead of saying, I'm going to write about pacifism, or I'm going to write about how colonialism's bad, instead she just sort of writes a story that sees the world differently. Like, instead of a sword-bearing, fated hero, she writes about a heroic sort of communicator, or an ambassador, or an anthropologist. And it's so interesting because 
she kind of delivers that message in more of a subtle way, I guess, in that she's just telling a different kind of story with a different kind of structure and a different mm -hmm. kind of mindset. So I'm thinking, what about writing in a way that approaches the relationship between human beings and the natural world very differently? Like tra the traditional Western idea is that humans are separate from nature and humans rule over nature. And how much of it is that, well, how much of fiction does or how much of fiction should kind of shift away from that. Like I'm thinking of the, this isn't written fiction, but film, Miyazaki's movies, they have this, they take it for granted that human beings are not separate from nature. It's there, it's there, it's a part of us, and it's not always cute, and we are not masters of it. Yeah, so um, the anthology that I'm working on right now is uh, in collaboration with uh, a research institute in Japan. It's the Research Institute for Humanity and Nature, and they're helping to um, fund and, and edit this anthology called Multi-Species Cities, and that's pretty much the premise of, of this anthology. All the stories involve um, humans and either animals or plants. Uh, some, you know, some of them are about like trees or plants, but a lot of them are about humans and animals and how, you know, how humans and, and the natural world can, uh, can interact in a healthier way in an urban setting. So, so, I mean, yeah, that's definitely the premise that, that we took with this, with this anthology. And mm. so I, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, humans are not separate. You know, we, we have sort of placed ourselves um, no. as a separate entity, but we're not. We're still very much part of nature. And, um, and I, think it's a, I think it'll be important as we move forward into, uh, you know, the landscape that we are uh, shaping in the world right now to reconnect with, uh, with some of the natural world, um, right. you know, plants, animals, uh, fungi, insects, all of that, and understand how, how we're all interconnected. Right, right, right. Like uh, something that really struck me, I can't even remember where I heard it, was the idea that humans see themselves as separate from the ecosystem or we don't live in an ecosystem, but it's like, well, cities are mm -hmm. an ecosystem. Yeah, cities are definitely an ecosystem, yeah. There's a type of animal that lives there. It's an ecosystem, and I'm, and I remember it's such a simple point. But when I first heard it, I'm like, whoa, because you're not used to thinking of that, right? It's like there's the city, and then there's the countryside, and the countryside is nature, even though the countryside is often not like growing wild in its own way. I mean, farms are affect are developed by human beings, and 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 that sort of thing, and. Uh, I, I think that's just such a fantastic way of putting it, and and, and a way of getting things into, you know, a different mindset. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's really the big thing that I think we need to do in the near future is just change our mindset, um, change our mindset about our place in this world and our you know, responsibility to this world. And if we can change yeah. the mindset, then we can make actual change in the world. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose fiction would be a big way of doing that, a big part of doing that. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly not the end-all, be-all, but um, it doesn't hurt. Of course you know, not. You know, but... it's uh, a lot of um, a lot of tech, a lot of technology. Um, you know, is inspired by things that people saw in uh, in science fiction and thought, well, that that's cool. How do we create that? And we've done that in the past, and uh, we can we can keep doing that. It's just which trajectory do we go with it? Yeah. Right. 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 And and fiction, I mean, it it doesn't magically change everything, but it does affect the way that people see the world. Exactly. I think in a huge way. <laughs> yeah. Now, talk. Let's talk about the climate in the foreground or the background. Um, and this is this might sound a little bit silly, but at the gym last winter, uh, I watched a lot of Har Hallmark Christmas movies. I know they're terrible, but that's what was on the TV in front of me, and. Something that struck me as feeling a little weird and uncomfortable was they all have big snowy white Christmases, right? Like every Hallmark Christmas movie is there's snow on the ground, there's snow in the trees, there's icicles. But I'm living in the Northeast. We haven't really had a white Christmas in years. I mean, I'm in New York. Christmas was 72 degrees Fahrenheit a couple of years ago. It was crazy. More often than not, we just get this slushy, sort of above freezing Christmas. And the dissonance between this portrayal on TV, even though, like... 
it's a Hallmark Christmas movie rom-com. It's not Citizen Kane here. But the dis- the dissonance between that and the reality that as we're actually facing it really kind of got to me. And it just made me feel so uncomfortable in this way that seems kind of silly considering what the subject matter is. I mean, I'm watching Melissa Joan Hart fall in love with a nutcracker who's been transformed into a man. This is obviously not meant to be deep. But <laughs> I just start thinking, like, how many rom-coms do that? How many rom-coms actually have, like, huh, it's a weird warm winter this year and and it like it just seems kind of weirdly wrong to me that we're just kind of pretending everything's normal in our regular movies i don't know like we're these that they're taking place in this world that no longer exists Mm. so i'm wondering are there other ways like that that writers and entertainers sort of ignore the reality of climate change like should stories that aren't overtly about it. I mean, it's it's a rom-com. It's not about climate change. Can they or should they still kind of include that in the background? Or, again, am I thinking too much about this? Should I leave Melissa Joan Hart alone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think I, I find it very interesting that that made you uncomfortable. And, um, I mean... Even the fact that you noticed that is, is kind of is kind of interesting, and um, you know, and I wonder, I wonder if other people have that, that same reaction. But um, I've definitely seen some some recent um, so, you know stories and, and movies and such that, that are definitely not about climate change that do kind of incorporate it into into the background a little bit. Um, and I think I think that's smart, and I think that's a way that you can um, you know kind of kind of sneak it in without being you know too overt, but. I don't know, like, I mean, thinking about the, the Hallmark Christmas movie, you know, these are romances, right? And, well, but I mean, romance romance as a genre is, like, more fantasy than fantasy is, you know? And it is that comfort, it is that comfort food and that, um, right. you know, that escapist kind of thing. So I think that you could tell a, a very nice uh, romance in uh, on a background of, of a climate change world. Actually, that's one of the stories in the Solar Punk Summers uh uh, does just that and you know you can tell you can tell a nice uh, you know happy romance with this stuff in the background too but I don't think you have to you know I think I don't know I, I, I find it very interesting that um, you know that you mm. notice that and I I don't think you're <laughs> overthinking it I think it's just you know part of the part of the world we live in but um, I also kind of think just let the let the romances be romance <laughs> they're serving their own purpose maybe chill out a little bit yeah, I, it's it's just something that strikes me because I mean, popular entertainment TV shows always have like, there's the Christmas episode, and for the one episode, mm-hmm. every there's snow everywhere, and I'm wondering, how long are we gonna keep doing this? Like, when are they finally gonna stop doing that? Yeah, I live in <laughs> I live in New Mexico. We hardly ever get a white Christmas. Oh wow, it's just okay. not a thing. I mean, we we do get snow here, but um, you know, not not that much. You don't expect it. Yeah. No. You're not like, oh, well, there's going to be snow on the ground for Christmas. <laughs> like, nah, probably not. <laughs> yeah, it's just for me, it just mm-hmm. struck me just because, you know, I'm in New York and I've seen throughout the course of my life, like winter getting weaker and later and weaker yeah. and later and weaker and later and weaker and later. And I don't see yeah. any of that reflected in so much of the pop culture that that's out there. And I just find that unsettling, <laughs> even though it's for a silly thing. Yeah, I think the way that New York is depicted in general, in uh, you know, in fiction and movies and such, is is not very realistic. I haven't been there personally, but uh, but for just from what I understand, the the way that it's depicted is is often sort of uh, fantastical and uh, not not reflective of the real yeah. reality. So I think the climate is just one part of that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That is true. Anyway, um, so I'm going to come to a more well, from, from the extremely uh, mm-hmm. fluffy topic of L- Melissa Joan Hart to a bigger question, which is, can art really change anything? Like, is raising awareness enough? Is Or are we just sort of entertaining people and not bringing it anywhere? Like, one thing I always think about is Berlin. Like, before, before the war, before, before the rise of the Nazi party, Berlin had this amazingly open queer culture. There was this queer art nightclub scene that was just awesome and fantastic and open and expressive. And it 
you know, didn't stop Mm -hmm. what came after that. So uh, occasionally as an artist, I find myself, or a writer, I find myself Mm -hmm. asking, like, how much power do we actually have, you know? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, So I think, no, it's not enough. Um, Science fiction isn't going to save the world just by itself. Um, I do think that, as we talked about earlier, it, it can be powerful in, ch- in terms of changing people's mindsets and in terms of letting people understand uh, these issues on a more personal level. Climate fiction um, stories bring it down to, you know, the characters and, you know, the family and friends and, and such that are, that are affected by, the, by these issues. It makes it a lot more personal than just a bunch of, like, graphs and, and scientific facts. Right. So so, um, so science fiction, uh, fi- you know, fiction in general, fantasy, because there's some fantastic climate fiction that's fantasy too, like uh, um, mm-hmm. N.K. Jemisin's The Fifth Season is a great example. You know, this, this kind of stuff, it can uh, help people understand the issues, it can help people change their mindsets, and it can inspire actual action. Something that I'm seeing a lot of right now is um, people starting to grow gardens um, as a you know, reaction both mm. to climate change and to the and to the the pandemic and the supply chain issues and you know quarantine and all that. Some people are reacting to this by growing a garden, and um, I'm actually trying to do that myself. I know nothing about how to do it, but I'm trying. Yeah. Um, and one of the one of the reasons that I'm trying it is because I've been so steeped in um, in this type of fiction that where that's the norm. You know, often in, in solar punk mm. futures. Uh, the food system is much more localized. You know, it's backyard gardens or uh, rooftop gardens or uh, you know vertical gardens that are that right. are local. And um, and so I've I've thought a lot about the ways that we could change our our food systems and and that actually did inspire me to try to do it myself. And uh, you know I might suck at it, mm. but I'm trying. And <laughs> right. So anyway, fiction isn't the isn't the solution, but it's also, you know, this is the skill set that I have and this is how I feel like I can contribute right. to to doing something toward creating a better future and uh, mm-hmm. you know, and so that that's what I can do. It's not all I can yeah. do, but it's, you know, it's one thing that I right. that I can do and that makes mm-hmm. me feel like I I am doing something something positive toward the future. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is something. Now, this is a bit more of a grimmer topic, uh, the idea of art <laughs> and entertainment in an, in a climate apocalypse, if I'm using a rather um, mm-hmm. extreme term. Does art, does fiction matter when the world's on fire? And can it, can art and culture survive, you know, what people like to call a climate apocalypse? Like, Occasionally when I'm writing, uh, well, right now, we're all sort of shut-ins right now during the pandemic. I have had such writer's block because I just keep thinking, what does this matter? (laughs) Yeah, I think art matters more when the world is on fire. I think that art and writing and, you know, art in all of its many forms, this is the way that humans understand the world around us. And, you know, we do it through creating art and we do it by seeking out art. And right now, a lot of people are seeking out a lot more art. You know, there's when we are kind of stuck in our homes, uh, that's one of the first things that people do is like, what what new show can I watch? Mm. What book can I read? What art? Right. You know, what art can I look at through this virtual tour? Like there's a a lot of people really looking for that for for comfort for stimulation for a second sense of connection when they can't get connection from uh you know being around other people they look for it in art and so yeah when the yeah. world's on fire whether it's you know whatever type of disaster it is i think the art that comes out of that is important and i think that the art that we mm. f- find in the midst of it is is also important um, in terms of can it survive a climate apocalypse, I mean, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't have a good answer to that one. I also think yeah. climate change isn't really an apocalypse. It's, it's going to be, you know, it already is uh, devastating. And in, in some regions of the world, it's going to be more devastating as time goes on. Right. But it's not that sudden explosion like the nuclear war. You know, mm. it's, it's not a sudden right 
change. It's like a gradual change. And so I think there will be disasters along the way, but I think in general yeah. it's going to be gradual enough that we can adapt along with it. And, you know, not everything will survive. Mm -hmm. Not everything about, you know, not all the art will survive, yeah. not all our culture will survive, not all our, all our tech will survive, but yeah. other things will come out of it and we'll, we'll bring some of it along the way. Hmm. Yeah, that is something I've been thinking too, because I, I, you know, I'm involved in a lot of like leftist movements and thinking about mm -hmm. the future. And this might sound like a weird thing, but big budget movies, I'm thinking, okay, let's say we live in a future where corporations don't exist anymore, resources have been more equitably distributed. Is there going to be like something like Star Wars, right? Because it takes mm. crazy amounts of resources to make something like that. And I'm thinking in a world where there are no billionaires, like, are we going to have that entertainment? I, I would happily live in a world without that if it means that people are are equal and it's mm -hmm. be better. Like, I totally would, but I've always kind of had this curiosity in the back of my head, like, what, how different will culture be and what will it mm -hmm. look like and... <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a good point. And it probably, yeah, probably we won't have something exactly like that. We'll have something different. More folk art. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Which would be neat, actually. Yeah. All right. So here, here's a switching from mindsets to materialism. <laughs> um, should we as artists and writers think about how we might be materially complicit in all this stuff in the way we make art? Like... I've met writers who give out a lot of merchandise, a lot of like little plastic trinkets to promote themselves. And, and when I see that, I, a part of me starts thinking like, cool, that can go in the Great Pacific garbage patch. Thank you. <laughs> I think about like the resources that go into making books, making smartphones, the energy spent, say, just making a TV show, the possible environmental damage caused by filming on location in a natural environment. Like I believe the filming of Titanic ended up polluting a local bay with a lot of uh, chlorinated water. Do artists need to start thinking about our own material complicity in this with the way we produce art, the, the way we market art, and our associations with mega corporations? Like I'm thinking about writers who have exclusive contracts with Amazon, right? Like, okay, maybe you have a message that's very environmentally friendly and very uh, revolutionary in some ways, but through the delivery of the message, you're you're helping making money for and only for Jeff Bezos. And whatever you think of him, I'm going to guess Jeff Bezos is not going to be part of the solution, you know, mm. <laughs> to whatever our world problems are. <laughs> so it's like, as writers, how can we avoid being complicit in it? On the one hand, it's like, look, we're a part of society and we're working in the society exists, you know, we're working in a society that in which we might have to own a car because there's no public transportation. We're working in a society in which the computers that we use have microchips that are mined in ways that are really unethical and, and uneco-friendly. Like, how much power do we have? How guilty should we feel? <laughs> I guess maybe that's not a very useful yeah. question. How guilty should we feel? But what can we do, you know? Yeah, uh, this is a tough question. And um, so before I was publishing fiction, I was writing um, a, a nonfiction column for a website, uh, for an envi environmental website um, about ethical consumption. And, you know, it was right. a lot of uh, articles about, you know, these big corporations and what uh, steps they were taking to make their products more sustainable. And, um, you know, and all of them, I want to go back at some point to my old articles and just like check in and see how much of this actually happened. Because yeah. back when I was writing this, they were all these like, mm -hmm. you know, 5, 10, 15 year projections. Like by this year, you know, a lot of them were like, by the year 2020, mm -hmm. we'll have, you know, this percentage, uh, you know, of sustainably sourced seafood right. in our restaurant or something like that. You know, a lot of them were, you know, dates that have already passed or are coming up and I kind of want to go check and see like how much of this actually happened. Anyway, ethical consumption is practically impossible in our current society. Right. And um, I'm thinking also of the, the good place. Yeah. And you know, kind of spoiler, I guess, for, uh, for the show, the good place. But, you know, there's this premise that, you know, people have to get a certain number of 
points of you know doing positive things in the world to get into the good place versus the bad place and they they uncover that like no right. one has gone to the good place for a really long time because it's impossible to actually yeah, get it's like 400 years yeah or something. because it's impossible to get those points because you know <laughs> yeah you you uh, buy some flowers for your grandma and that should give you you know some points but those flowers were like unsustainably harvested by my you know uh, workers pesticides you know. And yeah the- yeah and the pesticides exactly exactly so all that stuff you know makes <laughs> it just outweighs so you know there's there's the saying that there's right. no ethical consumption under capitalism and but you know as artists we can be at least aware of uh of some of the environmental impacts of our stuff like you said with the with the swag like do you really need those plastic bracelets with your book title on it i I don't know with with so world weaver press is a small press this is the the company that i run and we do print on demand so we have paper Mm. books but they are rather than printing up a big digit you know a big uh, print run we just print a few at a time and so there's the carbon impact of them being shipped to wherever mm-hmm. they're being shipped to, but um, we're, it decreases the uh, paper waste a little bit and, um, you know, it is a slightly mm-hmm. better solution. It's not the best solution, but it's a slightly better one. And, you know, ebooks also eliminate mm-hmm. that paper waste, but, but ebook Kindles mm-hmm. and uh, tablets and such get made with rare earth metals that, that can have bad history along with those too. So what do we do? What do we do? There's, um, all we can do is, you know, kind of be aware of these issues and do, make the choices that are a little bit better and they might not be the best. They not, they might not be the solution, Mm -hmm. but just choosing the one that is a little bit healthier for, you know, for the planet, for the people. Right. Right. Like on the one hand, like there's that, there's that old canard of like you say you're a socialist but you own a smartphone checkmate like i'm sorry i live in society i don't know what to tell you but if you as a as a writer as an author have a choice to like contract your book to super evil corp versus mildly less evil corp like it might be good to (laughs) i'm gonna go with mildly less evil corp like i think raffi is actually a really good uh, example of that as an artist he's you know, the children's song guy who mm-hmm. did like Baby Beluga yeah. Whale and Wheels on the Bus and stuff. But he's he's spent years, um, he's had tons and tons of offers of corporate sponsorship because he still does festivals and stuff. He does music festivals and he's declined it over and over again because these corporations that wanted to sponsor him are corporations that harm children in his mind. Like there were fast food and junk food corporations. And he's like, I don't want my music to be used to sell you know, soda pop to little kids. Mm-hmm. That's not good for them. I don't want my music to be used to sell stuff that's to children. I, I want to nurture their their creativity and their spirits and not just suck money out of mm-hmm. them. So I think that that is something that writer we as writers, and particularly writers in, in fandom, writers in the geek community might want to think about, because, I mean, sci-fi and fantasy as... as um, optimistic and ethical the themes might be a lot of geekdom is like let's buy the funko pops let's buy the plastic shit let's you know consume 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 and i'm not i don't it might be different for you it might be different for different writers but i find that kind of uncomfortable like i find it really uncomfortable and weird to to think about okay this this story that was really about like the environment and the fight against tyranny okay we're using it to sell funko pops which are made out of plastic probably made in like a sweatshop you know toxic Mm -hmm. dyes blah 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 like but then again when you when you think about that ultimately it's like well books are made of paper you know (laughs) that used to be a tree well (laughs) yeah you can yeah you can definitely go down this rabbit hole you can go completely crazy yeah and i actually i have a i have a friend who um was offered a she's not she's not in science fiction she was writing a memoir but um she was writing a memoir about uh her her time Mm -hmm. in africa and um she got an offer from a big five publisher mm. and then learned that um, she would have no control wow. over 
how it was printed and she, you know she, it was really important to her because mm-hmm. she was writing about uh, it just because it was important to her in general but especially because she was writing about people who were all who are already right. being affected by climate change it was important to her to um, you know print this on re- recycled paper and to have uh, use sustainable right. ink and you know to do do what she could to to make the book itself the material product uh, more sustainable and more you know supportive of, of the environment so she actually turned down that deal and decided to self-publish instead because then she then she could be wow. in control of that and so she kickstarted it wow and, and that's that's not easy no. to do i mean the big five holy yeah crap. yeah so she turned down yeah. the software kick, you know kickstarted it published it herself and you know and created like this limited run of you know beautifully designed uh, sustainable books that's amazing you know but what she lost in that is is audience because you can definitely gain it you can get a big audience with with self-publishing if you do a certain series of things but you know but it's especially with a with a book like that like the the tops self-published authors are generally not memoirists or so so she gave up um potentially a really big audience uh to do this so it's you know give there's there's give and take (laughs) Yeah, yeah, your mm-hmm. friend's brave, man. That's yeah. not an easy choice to make. That's that's Yeah, and I was thinking gosh. about that too when you're talking about Ow. Amazon. A lot of you know, with what you were saying about, yeah. about uh Rafi, that like that's cool, but he has a lot of privilege to be able to do that. Like when you're when you're just trying to, you know, create right. something that's, you know, self-published or small press or you know, just not really mainstream like that. If we kind of yeah. rely on some of these big corporations, to, to find an audience. So right. it's tough. Yeah. It is tough. And in a way it's like, well, how do you really get away from corporations unless you're like handwriting each book on leaves in your backyard? Mm. It's <laughs> right. like, okay, well you have a Patreon, that's a corporation, you know, you you put stuff mm-hmm. on the internet. Well you've got that's mm-hmm. there's an ISP, there's a domain host, there's your your platform is probably owned by a big evil corporation. Like there's not much of an escape unless you just draw it in chalk on the wall in your neighborhood right. somewhere. And there, or you go like full yeah. medieval monk and press your own books by yeah. hand. Yeah, and there are artists that choose to do that, and that's cool too. But yeah, no, there's no escape from it. It's just the society we live in. But I think just even being aware of that, just understanding how much control these, right. these things have um, is kind of a first step. And uh, then when... If an opportunity arises for that to change, then, you know, the more we're aware of, of it in the first place, the more chance we might have to actually seize the means when if when and if that opportunity ever arises. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's tricky that there isn't, like, an easy answer to any of this. Like, well, this is what you should do, and that's ethical, and that's the right answer. Like, I don't know. I'm sorry. No, there's no prescriptive way. Yeah, and it's easy to sneer at other people, but if, like, Jeff Bezos said, like, hey, Raquel, I will offer you this giant bag with a, with a dollar sign on it full of monies, I, I, it would be very hard for me to say, no, Jeff Bezos, I have my principles. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we're going to wind down. Before we go, uh, where can people find your work? How can they support you? Sure. So I have published a number of short stories in magazines. A couple of my um, solar punk stories are The Spiral Ranch, which is in Dreamforge magazine, and that story is available to read for free on the Dreamforge website. The Chrysalis in Sunlight is another story in Giganotosaurus that's also online. And then I have a solar punk story called Writing in Place, which is in a very cool anthology from Microcosm Press um, called Biketopia, Feminist Bicycle Science Fiction in Extreme Futures. So it's a very particular oh, wow. niche. It's awesome. <laughs> um, so those are some of the stories that That's I've written. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, Microcosm Press is a really cool small press. I highly recommend them. And they, they have th- definitely thought very strongly about some of these issues that you've, that you've brought up and, uh, and have changed some of the ways that they, uh, that they distribute their books as a result. So, 
anyway, so those are some of the stories that I've written. Um, I also have edited Glass and Garden Solar Punk Summers mm. and Glass and Garden Solar Punk Winters, and I'm working on that multi species cities anthology. So these are available at all of your major corporations like Amazon mm. and Barnes and Noble and Kobo and uh, all of those, as well as directly through our website, which is worldweaverpress.com. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was great to chat with you. Yeah, and thanks for bearing with me and my very rude cat, who has finally quieted down. That's pretty funny. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Now, so that is all for this episode. If you like what you heard, head on over to patreon.com slash writegood and sign up. Subscribers get early access to our regular episodes and access to the Discord where you can suggest episode ideas and talk about books. Book Club tier members get a monthly bonus episode in which we go in-depth on a work of fiction by authors like Ursula Le Guin or Franz Kafka. And join us next time when we talk about writing in a body. Until then, keep writing good. This has been Write Good with R.S. Benedict, Hosted by R.S. Benedict and produced by Matt Keeley for KS Media LLC. This has been a Kitty Sneezes production. For comments and concerns, please write to us at writegood at kittysneezes.com. That's R-I-T-E-G-U-D at kittysneezes.com. If you'd like to support us, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash writegood. Kittysneezes.com in color.